Um, I just wanted to mention that we will be getting together in the lab in December. And uh, Jeremiah is going to be flying in. Jeremy might be there. Um, Wayne might, might come in. So if anyone wants to come to our lab in Hawthorne, New Jersey, and uh, be a part of these experiments, uh, we did rent out a guest house. Uh, somebody uh, donated some money, so we're able to um, actually get things moving over here. And we're, tr we're trying pretty much every experiment we can think of that we can do in a reasonable amount of time and budget. And uh, Mike, your, your experiment seems extremely interesting. I'm actually uh, trying to get those gyroscopes right now so we could have them here on time. Um, I, I use the exact same gyroscope myself. I find them to be yes. the And uh, the servo thing, that's very simple. We'll be able to contact you about um, how to set that all up. Um, I'm pretty familiar with uh, using uh, uh, RC airplanes and servos and all that yes. stuff. So set that up yeah. pretty easily for it to go back and forth. Um, have the battery on board and have really like a self-propelled device that is yeah. irrefutable. Yeah. And if we get the thing to turn, that would be even cooler. Yeah. Well, well like and, said, Tom, yeah, Tom's yeah. been trying to get me to get it on an air hockey table, but my I had to vacate my office for two months because my wife does teaching. And uh, with the no. COVID bug here, she had to use my office to do her schooling. So I'm just getting back up to speed again. How much does that whole thing weigh, by the way? Uh, that uh, by a couple of pounds. Uh, so you're going to have to have a pretty large yeah, surface yeah. area in order for it to float. You might be better yeah. off just uh, putting it in a tub in, in, in a large well, pool. Or something. I, I, I already did the calculations on it. It, 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 ta it takes about uh, 18 square inches to lift it. That's it? Yeah. Okay. You can try it out. You got to get a big table so you have room to move around. Well, yeah. there's a lot. There's a lot of these uh, chunky cheeses places. Uh, uh, you know, video game pool halls, whatever you want to call it. The four person one. That's what you want to get. The really big. Yeah. Table. Rent it well, out. You know, they, um, they have the the four by eight tables, which is plenty big enough. I, I should I should mention. Sorry, I should mention. Uh, Douglas has his hand raised. Can I take a? I, and it might have been for Tom, but. Uh, Douglas, are you still there? Yes. Um, well, it really it, it was for Tom, but some of you are familiar with with Tom's work, so maybe you can you can answer for him. Um, so I, I noted that he has uh, a series of books, Ele Electrogravitics one and two, and he said three is in the works. So, and this relates to obviously to the topic of alternative propulsion engineering by by engineering. Uh, you know, interactions with gravity and inertia. So I, what, what can we learn from nature about this? Um, I have read quite a bit and looked at um, purported evidence of, of alteration of um, gravitational effects in the vicinity of tornadoes. So which are obviously, you know, spinning highly charged phenomena. So is it, is it, do, do, do people share the view that uh, there are levitation effects in the vicinity of tornadoes and that it's not just some kind of aerodynamic um, effect? I, my personal feeling is it's a combination of both. Well, well, right, but it not not just a elect, not just a um, aerodynamic effect that that uh, that that this natural phenomenon create creates some kind of modification, which seems to be a temporary modification of the material of various things, living and non-living objects, which then seem to be. To weigh less and to be much more affected by. Um, yeah. uh, also, there are uh, locations on the planet where things go a little weird too. There's one just south of me here down in Oregon, and there's other places uh, around the country that they have gravity anomalies. But in terms of um, what may be happening physically in the vicinity of a phenomenon such as a tornado. Uh, there's a lot to understand there about its dynamics and electrodynamics and, yeah. and so on, fluid dynamics. But um, 
you know, I also regard um, <laughs> uh, flying saucers, UFOs, uh, unidentified aerial phenomena as indeed natural phenomena. Um, so I guess I, my point is that there may be, you know, other, you know, natural phenomena that we can look to for examples of uh, altering the interaction of macro scale objects with the gravitational force and with inertial forces. And that obviously looking at examples from nature, those are not experiments, but they might inform our experiments or suggest experiments. You sound like Tesla now, because that's exactly what he did. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to to, to raise that because I'm, I'm interested in um, you know, looking at, at phenomena as, you know, as ideas for experiment. <clears throat> but that's what he based his electric motor on was nature. Okay. Well, let me see. Oh, you have the question there, yeah. Okay, for oh. me to talk? Yes, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, is Mark still there? Mark Sokol? Uh, we kind yes, of we, we kind of got we got off the track from the microwave guides, and uh, you know that's part of your whole propulsion system too. The question is, of course, when you the microwave guides go into your chamber, okay, that's where you're losing your tuning. You need a tuning system for the chamber because that's the way all these microwave systems work. Basically, once the microwaves leave the waveguide, well. <laughs> You have, to, it depends upon the, the uh, geometry of your cavity and the size of your sample and its location in the chamber as to how the system has to be tuned so that most of the microwaves go into your sample and not everywhere else. So when you have to put all these backboards of salt water, you're not effectively using those microwaves. Yeah, I, I completely understand that. That's waste energy. Um, and I'm, I'm completely baffled about how anybody can get 100% of that energy in. I'm sure there's there's some sort of way of doing it, maybe in a, like a closed loop system, but then you're gonna have, you're gonna run into problems of, uh, you know, a back for standing wave, you know, SWR, and that can damage your tube, so. Well, that's why you have to, you have to build in, you know, something to protect you from the reflected power. I can send you some of the diagrams from our own microwave systems in our lab to show you how that's done, but at the same time, um, I'm just wondering if you're trying to apply this to an actual craft, you know, some kind of a, a thing, how are the microwaves contained in that? You know, like, I, I oh, just- okay. they're not contained things. inside. Okay, so I understand your question. Um, it's pretty simple, actually. What they're doing is you have a massive electromagnet around the edge and that creates a laminar magnetic field if you follow the field lines, sort of like a flying saucer, because that's where the, you know, let's say 3000 Gauss strength would be it would follow sort of a, a parabola, or you could go in the smack center. You'd also get a, a laminar field over there perfectly flat, which is where the spinning disc uh, device was. So if you wanted to orient the hull of the craft and work outwards inwards, you would follow the laminar field lines, which would basically be a flying saucer. And then you'd eject the, elect the um, microwaves outside the craft. And the um, body of the craft would act as a shield protecting the uh, participants from you know, microwave energy. And we also see uh, extraterrestrials walking around in uh, Faraday suits. Um, and I actually have some material over here. We plan on making a Faraday hoodie for these experiments. I'm gonna show you, it's really nice material. I, I, yeah, there's less EMF and other places like that sell those, uh, those kinds of uh, materials, yeah. Right, um, so I, I, I'm not clear on where the microwaves are coming from. Like, where is it positioned outside the craft that it's able to, you know, cr create a field around the craft? Uh, I'm, I'm confused about that as well. I think what we could possibly do. Um, Let me pull up a terrible patent for you guys that is very controversial. Give me just a uh, moment here. It's relevant. It the it, it's okay. relevant and it shows microwaves being beamed out the craft in their position therein. Okay, well, we'll have to check that out. If you could pull it up Probably, on your screen, uh, want, yeah. maybe uh, share screen and uh, pull it up. So what I was thinking is you'd have an emitter on the top and then you'd have sort of a microwave cavity against the craft that creates a, um, 
you know, the, that, that allows the microwaves to come out in all directions and you have it on both sides. So it's both emitting from the bottom along the edges of the craft and along and from the top along the edges of the craft. Um, and, uh, you know, it interacts with the entire hull of the craft. This effect is probably, uh, most probably not 100% efficient because people who have been close to uh, uh, flying saucers in the past have gotten burns uh, along the lines of what you'd expect with a microwave burn. There was also um, ionizing radiation, which might be related to a power source. I'm not really sure, but microwave burns have been noticed uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, fire from fire in the sky. That uh, that famous case with the redhead. Travis Walton. Tra uh, Travis Walton. Yeah, he got some burns, and uh, he was actually treated in a uh, extraterrestrial hospital. Uh, that's the way he uh, explained it to me. So, um, yeah, the the dangerous place in a flying saucer is right outside of it, and uh, I would imagine spaceports of the future would be Faraday cages in themselves. And, the, and then maybe you'd have a whole bunch of craft landing all together. Everyone comes out, gets inside, and they all take off together. Like the entire airport just lights up. Everyone takes off together. And then the new batch comes and lands. This way, it, it'd, be, it'd be really hard for TSA. See them. <laughs> okay. But for, this, for the purpose of your experiment, then, what I'm thinking is that you, you really need a horn antenna because a horn antenna is going to actually direct the microwaves to your sample, as opposed to what you have is a, you just have a rectangular waveguide. That's like what you get in your microwave oven. It's just going to be for a multi-mode system. It's just going to be spreading microwaves anywhere. Oh, we have some horn antennas. Um, okay. We actually 3D printed some of them. I'll, I'll get them in a second. Well, I'm not going to know anything about them, so. <laughs> anyway, it's just little details like this we have to figure out. Yeah, well, thank you for your help, Tanya. I, I, I definitely appreciate it. I know Mark's excited as well. Well, it's a little bit I can contribute. I just do microwave work, so. Well, I think that this conference has gone really well today. I'm really excited. It, it, this will be interesting. I have to find a way to split this up and upload it to YouTube. And then Jeremy has the full thing as a YouTube Live, so. Um, you know, so it's it's exciting. But the thing that I'm excited about too is that people are seeing more of an experimental side of this. And so, you know, unlike the conference, your your standard conference, people are seeing kind of. I think it's a little bit more live and real. And so I'm hoping that younger folks out there, you know, can help get inspired and stuff like that from it. Okay, so this is uh, one one of the wave guys I have. This thing's a a beast. Right. And um, this is this is another waveguide I got, which is capable with uh, 10 gigahertz. And um, finally, we 3D printed a uh, a waveguide. Okay. And um, yeah, we got all different kind of results with uh, every different waveguide setup. Um, basically, this is the antenna, the emitter. Mm -hmm. Antenna is basically half that that diameter. It's really small. And then it goes into an isolator, which then goes into an attenuator, which we're really just using as a waveguide um, because the isolator can't be near the magnetic field from the uh, that creates the dynamic nuclear orientation. So we have to separate it with this, which is made out of aluminum with uh, steel bolts. And then um, comes out the end and the sample was sitting in our last experiment right at the edge of the, uh, um, the microwave waveguide, which probably caused some uh, SWR issues. I was gonna say, it you don't necessarily want it right up at the end. Um, and that's where you get into you know, a, a chamber that would actually be appropriate for the size of your wavelength you're dealing with and everything. I, I, have, I don't, I'm not that good at designing systems. I mean, I've worked with them, but I haven't designed them. So I just know the kinds of ones that I have worked with. And I, maybe we can kind of go off of that to optimize it for your system. Right, but right. I, you may want to fiddle. You may want to fiddle with where that that sample is placed because you're going to find there's going to be a sweet spot, and that's where your microwaves are going to be most concentrated. And everything else, you know, it's not as good. But I don't think it's going to be right up against there, honestly. Um, yeah, that's very possible. And I've seen in many um, configurations, many uh, sketches of these type of experiments that they had actually a completely enclosed chamber. There wasn't an open end for the microwaves to uh, come out of. Exactly. So, so that might be what, where we have to go. Um, and we the difficulty do, there is you can't look in. Usually once you do an enclosed chamber, it's really hard to get pictures of what's going on inside. Uh, 
So, Mark, I should uh, mention, so Garrett and Chris Luman in chat have questions as well. I'm not sure if you'd want to bring them on or not. Um, yeah, just in, in just one second. Oh, well, I mean, Garrett was talking about the microwave plasma waveguide. That they're both talking about the waveguide. Sorry, that was. Oh, well, sure. Um, Garrett, turn off your uh, turn on your uh, camera first, so we can see you. Um, we were thinking of just putting like a little hole inside so we can um, have a, a weight measurement. And uh, in terms of looking inside with a camera, I don't know how I would be able to do that because. Any can the, we got a couple GoPros, but they'll probably get destroyed at these energy levels. <clears throat> you, need to, you need a fiber optic camera of some kind so that your fiber yeah. is in there and goes way yeah. out. I but agree with that. that. I, th I think that's what you need a fiber optic camera. Yeah, but there, even there, you have to be careful because uh, the resolution is cruddy usually. Yeah, yeah. I'm aware of that. And, and then you'll have to have the, the filtering, the uh, like grading on it, and that'll waste a lot of RF. Right. Uh, Garrett, what do you want to say? Uh, I think you muted yourself, Garrett. I have someone from the chat who said uh, a horn antenna is not needed. He spoke with an NMR expert um, with 20 years experience. Um, he said all you need is a solenoid where you can put the sample in the center of it. And um, something about then due to impedance mismatch with the environment, much of the energy will stay in the sol solenoid and only a little bit will come out due to the dipole oscillations. Um, and it should still be in a Faraday cage and uh, we can tune it with an LC capacitor. Um, we also mentioned that the, um, the, the, the fields don't um, move beyond the sample or, or earlier because uh, there's, they're actually Zenic summer field uh, or waves or what are called surface plasma and polaritons. So they're, they're near field or evanescent fields. They don't, they don't, um, they're not like uh, far fields, but. Uh, that doesn't really make any sense to me. Cause if you, um, if you, you that out, that microwave part? into open air, the, um, you know, the ohms of the, you know, the resistance of the uh, air is way off the 30 ohms or the 50 ohms that the, um, well, Power it's source. not like it's not through the not air the market. Field. Yeah, with the near field, you have these weird geometries that take place, and this goes into the antenna physics. Uh, Eric Dollar talks about this extensively, and there are a number of equations to sort of summate um, the near field effects. But here's one of the things that's observed: is when you have an electric charge that suddenly enters or exits a, a place, the area around where that charge exits or enters, if it generates a longitudinal field, as in the, uh, the charge enters, say, a uh, large object, like a sphere or a plate or something like that. And so you have this, this wave emitted fairly linearly from the surface. Near the surface of that plate, you may have propagation wave velocities significantly faster than velocity C. And uh, so in Dollard's case, they had measured speeds as high as uh, uh, four times the velocity of light. And then they would asymptotically taper off at some distance away from the radiating point. And in their case, that's what we're talking about with the faster than light transmission experiments where we wanted to try to measure those impulses from a Marx generator into one of these uh, plates. But uh, I would imagine in the same in the same vein too, when Alzafan was talking about this in these short fields, I think that uh, if you precess the electric fields of the electrons, you know, they have their generalized path and that sort of orients the entire space around them. If you suddenly move them, they would have the same sort of effect where you have these faster than light impulses and that could change the relativistic mass or the mass observed by that system. Go ahead, Chris, please. Hey, yeah, what about, what if, wouldn't it be possible to make like a, what's it called, a micro strip, but you know, larger. So you had like two copper strips right, right on top of each other and just fill the middle part with sample. It's kind of like the capacitors on the bottom of the UFO. So then you're just like energizing the entire strip if you're talking about Alzafon, the short answer is no, because we're, we're needing to modulate the sample with an electromagnetic wave that's in the very high microwave gigahertz frequency band. And to mm -hmm. try to oscillate a parallel plate capacitor with two copper strips where the sample is sandwiched in between at a gigahertz frequency would be, I, I would imagine, rather difficult. Um, it, it's you a possibility, to, though, I suppose. You'd you have could to make have a, an, the emitter at one end. Like, you'd have your... I don't know how you'd construct it, but I, I think this is done like like a like a microstrip. That's the best way I know how to describe it. It's done on PCBs. Hmm. Um, is there any way you could link to something in the chat, maybe where we could 
I, 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 I think because I I want to say this has been done, but and it's done commonly, just not in. I'm going to have to ask. I think if you were to stuff a sample inside of a horn antenna, you'd end up with a very high SWR or standing wave rate mm -hmm. ratio because the microwaves will hit the sample and just jump right back into your uh, into your well, emitter source, damaging that, it. So that depends. You have to be very careful about. That depends on like, what the conductivity of your sample is. A lot of these samples, I think, are going to have they're they're basically dielectrics. It's a lot We're of like, stuff. We're, we're working okay. with. Aluminum. If you're using a solid chunk of aluminum, no, but I mean, I'm imagining you're using like a uh, chunk of the magnesium cement with the aluminum and um, iron particles in it. Uh, what we use is an epoxy cement to attach the aluminum and iron particles together. And it's okay. about 97 and a half percent aluminum and uh, two and a half percent iron powder by weight. Okay. Just remember that the iron you're going to be coupling with the magnetic field portion of the of the microwaves, so it's not a dielectric effect; it's a magnetic effect. Uh, right. right. Also, the um, the iron also couples with the uh, laminar laminar uh, magnetic field, and we've had to it, we had to put in these um, guide wires that it would travel along so that it wouldn't twist in the magnetic field, and we're just getting the uh, actual weight measurement. That was a that was a tricky thing to set up. Went through a couple. 3D printed uh, iterations till we got to a final design. The reason why the iron is um, injected into the sample or why we why we uh, use it as inclusions is um, according to Elzapan's theory, as the electrons precess around them, they create these disruptive fields as a result of their reorientation. They will break or decouple from the magnetic field that's set up by the external electromagnet uh, creating the laminar field. So the iron inclusions help to conduct that field through the entire sample. And although they add only a small amount to the total effect, according to uh, David in a prior conversation, they are there simply to allow the magnetic field to make its way all the way through and also to offer some flux uh, during the delay period where the precession is at its highest intensity. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty uh, interesting. Yeah, basically the way um, I understood it from David is that the iron, um, allows the magnetic field to permeate the sample better. And it works as like a stepping catalyst where the um, dynamic nuclear orientation happens very quickly in the iron. The iron transfers its dynamic nuclear orientation to the aluminum and the aluminum acts as a reservoir for dynamic nuclear orientation, which then passes it on to the rest of the craft. So there's like a step using one element, which has uh, um, which is able to dynamically nuclear orientate pretty quickly, uh, but doesn't have a lot of battery life to maintain it. Then it moves to the uh, aluminum, which has a lot of battery life, but it can't really interact with it that well. So that's why you're using that as sort of a stepping stone to get more and more dynamic nuclear orientation. And then eventually you dynamically nuclear oriented the entire craft and its surroundings. And then you can go big, pil pick up these huge megalith blocks and build pyramids and call, tell everyone that you're God. So uh, we really need to figure out the waveguide part before we can build our pyramid. <laughs> Jeremiah is laughing his head off. Oh, you could probably also split the sea and you know confuse a whole bunch of Jews into thinking you're God too. So many things we can do with this technology. Jared, uh, Garrett's comment in the, in the chat about uh, using these uh, stub tuners and sliding shorts, that's kind of the system that we have at Penn State for some of our systems. So I don't know how you could design your cavity for, to accommodate something like that. But in the end, it doesn't really matter if your app, actual application is going to be, you know, an external application around a craft and from either end. Right, right. right. Uh, what we're doing over here in the lab is completely proof of concept. I don't even, I don't anticipate almost any of this equipment being used in a uh, full-size craft. Um, yeah. I'd anticipate the cost of building a prototype probably to be somewhere in the, uh, in the range of about one to $2 million. Um, that would be a prototype, but, but the end model, uh, when we finally have like the model three that goes to market, you're looking at probably a 30 or $40,000 vehicle that can, you know, travel in planet, anything that goes in the, uh, into outer space you're dealing with liability issues and um, I don't know how you, how the company's going to look at that, but these are, 
very exciting things. And, and my main passion in this is not to ferry people to the moon and Mars. Um, that's about as exciting as Antarctica. The real exciting part about this technology is mining the asteroid belt. Um, there's tons of money to be made there. And the benefit to the planet is, you know, cannot be understated. Getting rid of uh, all these mining operations on Earth and employing people out in the asteroid belt where they could literally take an entire chunk of metal. It's like almost pure nickel or pure iron. You just go to the asteroid, you chunk it off, bring it, drop it down in the factory where, they, uh, where they're doing their work and go back and get more. And every, you know, you know the prices of metal will drop uh, dramatically around the world and the need for open pit mining Will, will, will drop as well. Expect a Caterpillar to go out of business. And I would imagine that we have to uh, export an, an equal amount of mass off of the planet to uh, eventually prevent the Earth's uh, orbit from changing. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't be too worried about that. We're talking about material to build houses, you know, to build uh, buildings or- You never know around here. <laughs> What people well, if we think. master this technology, right, we could just, uh, we could just increase the rotational velocity of the earth to compensate for whatever mass we were adding. I mean, theoretically, right. Cause we've mastered effectively inertia at that point. So we shouldn't have to worry too much about gravity. Right. I mean, yeah, that, that's very much true. If, if we've mastered it to this level um, and then you get involved nuclear fusion or you involve very high power sources, um, maybe you could uh, move an object like the size of the moon and put it into its orbit. And there are people who think that that's actually what the moon is. Um, I'm not so convinced about that at all, but um, moving an asteroid, you know, to hit the earth and create the moon in its very early infancy, if there was a, uh, an ancient civilization that did that, I think that's a lot more plausible because um, it, it, it is possible to move objects around with, uh, with, with current technology. Um, actually, I had, a, I had an idea on that that I wanted to share. Like if there was an Apophis media, um, asteroid that was coming to earth, uh, the best way to um, push it out of its orbit would actually be to land a, a mini factory on the, uh, on the asteroid with solar panels. And what it would do is it would take regolith from the, uh, uh, from the asteroid, crunch it up, and then shoot it out with an ion rocket. And then it would you know, shoot out way past the escape velocity of the, um, of the asteroid and you just get thrust in the other direction. This is current technology that can be applied today. We can land it on Apophis and move it farther away in case we're, you know, afraid of uh, a collision. Yeah, that's, that, well, and that's been proposed before. I think NASA's ex played with that idea. They wanted to use a linear accelerator on the surface, so. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's probably the way to go for uh, something like that, but, um, yeah, is any any more questions out there? Go ahead, Garrett. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? No, nope, you're fine, man. All right. Um, so I, I may have missed it, but can you just show us, you know, from um, where the electricity is going into your microwave system and where it's exiting to your sample, just to get an idea of the mechanical setup? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, this is the current setup. Uh, the electricity enters over here and right over here, there is a, a tiny antenna. I can show you one. I have another, uh, another open one. Um, where did it go? The antenna is, is extremely small. You're talking about several millimeters thick. Um, this is a similar concept. This this thing over here is called a gun diode. Um, yep. it, works, it works off of a similar concept, but this actually produces a, um, an RF field. It's not just a, a, an emitter. And uh, you, you apply, I think, like 12 volts or something like that, and it emits a RF signal um, based on the size of the chamber. So yep. your frequency is basically the size of this chamber. But, uh, the, uh, the emitter point looks very similar to that. And then it goes through this uh, item, which is called an isolator. So this yep, is magnetic. Um, it, it has basically a magnetic field in the shape of a certain band of uh, microwaves. So it um, allows the microwaves to go one way and doesn't allow them to come back. So there's an in and an out. It's like a one-way valve for microwaves. And this is yep. very important because your equipment can get damaged by standing waves, by energy, you know, reflected energy that comes back. Um, the next part we have is the uh, attenuator, which is over here, which... Uh, 
it's, it moves up like that. Basically, what is in there is a little um, plane that turns sideways. When it turns 90 degrees, it's at its maximum. It's cutting off the, uh, the, the field. The field is now um, out of sync with itself, and it can no longer pass. It gets weakened, turned into heat inside the uh, attenuator. And uh, so you want to keep that at zero for maximum power, unless you want to do something else. And then this is the, uh, the waveguide horn that we designed uh, to maximize, uh, well, the electrical component is going up and down like that. And the magnetic component is going you know, right and left like that. So uh, this was to maximize the electric component of the field and expand the magnetic component to the size of the sample. And we stuck this up against the sample. It was almost, uh, the sample was literally sitting inside it and uh, we did see some strange effects. It was not much different than noise. And there was no weight, weight uh, gain or loss uh, noted above the noise, but there was no temperature change either, which was something that uh, David mentioned that they noticed that it, it did get very hot very quickly. So they're not, they were pulsing a lot more than 20 watts into the sample. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not even certain I even got one watt into this sample, you know, given this setup. Got it. If, if it's I've, not tuned, I'm sorry, if it's not tuned, you're not going to get any heating. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's correct. And uh, uh, tuning is key. We're going to have to get uh, different uh, probes to figure out what exactly is going on. And... Yeah, yeah. So you can you can make custom stub tuners and uh, and sliding shorts, a sliding short, and, and you put your sample in between those two components. And you can tune it, tune the forward and reflective power and, and, and modify where the hotspot is with respect to the total waveguide system. So, so both of those systems are, are components are really simple uh, uh, mm -hmm. to manufacture with rudimentary materials and methods. I mean, you'll get some losses, but you'll definitely have a higher variability and, and potential to modify where your hotspot's going to be. And, to be able to deposit as much power as as possible with with a rudimentary system unless you go full industry standard off the shelf waveguide components that are tuned to the frequency range that you're looking for um and which are widely available and all over the you know all over the spectrum on on ebay you know whether it be the waveguide components or the power supplies themselves but uh but the the the, the way in which you tune that there's been papers for the decades um, um, written on 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 tuning those the, those components to to deposit the energy where you want it um, and, and and a microwave plasma system I think would be a really good uh, you know the industry standard microwave plasma systems would be a really good starting point or, or next step because of the fact that they you have the applicators uh, that are basically uh, plunged inside of the waveguide. It's basically just a simple break in the waveguide um, that that uh, with the isolator to make sure that you don't have the reflective power uh, to have a directional coupler so that you could sample the power um, and 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 there's the power monitoring system just so that you know what's going on at all times are again widely available and. Uh, T Tanya or Tania, you, you work at Penn State. You work with, with microwave systems at Penn State, the same off the shelf uh, uh, microwave systems that, that we're talking about here? Some of them are. We actually did take an old plasma microwave system and we modified it. We modified it for um, to make a single mode cavity for use in another application. It's no longer in our lab. <laughs> yeah. Someone else has it. But uh, we've got a 915 megahertz system. It's an industrial system that everything's all already been made. You know, it's really nice to get yeah. stuff that's already made. But totally. at the same time, we haven't made a lot of things because we have a lot of military surplus stuff yeah. that we just cobble together as we need to uh, to make microwave systems. So yeah, it, it, pretty much we use the sliding uh, stop. What do we call that? Um, sliding short. Uh, yeah, the short. Um, Yep. in order to tune it, but it is an iterative process. It can be nerve wracking. It can drive you nuts to try to get the heating to the sample. You got to get that tuning just right or else nothing happens. Absolutely. And again, that's with a contained cavity. Now, see, if you look at Mark's setup, he's got a great big chamber. Yep. You know, ultimately, if you're going to a great big chamber, the microwaves are going all over the place. So you've got huge losses there. Yep. And then he's got this big backstop that's going to be sopping up all that microwave. He's losing all this energy 
you know, with 200 watts, you'd be surprised if you just had an enclosed cavity, boom, you could probably heat it just like that if you just tune it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but because yeah. you have your whole system set up right now, it's going to be a real challenge for you. You know, you're going to sock, you're going to sock it with this Klystron, and then you're going to be having microwaves leak out all over the place. And, and you and do a lot you. Less power then too. It's a lot more power too. Yeah. And I, I, you may not need all that. I'm just thinking that it's, it's just, I mean, we do a lot of heating of stuff at, at fairly low power. I would say within a, up to a kilowatt, you know, but we can still do, depending upon the sample, you know, 200 watts can make things just go pretty. 20, it's 20 watts for our traveling wave tube amplifier. Um, but if, if you can draw us like a CNC um, uh, code of, of what it is we need to uh, print and build, uh, we can totally build something, you know, based on that design. I just need somebody to design it for me, you know, that knows how these things would work and that it would tune itself. Well, you have uh, to, you know, what, what is the frequency you're, you're looking to apply right now? I mean, do you, are you just whatever, whatever? We might... have two, we have two ranges. So uh, one set up the, um, the traveling wave two amplifier works in the X band. And uh, that is only, only gives out about 20 Watts. Uh, although I think it works best um, towards the bottom of the X band. So like, eight to 10 gigahertz is when it's most efficient and it starts to uh, weaken at the higher uh, frequencies. Yep. And the uh, Klystron, which is the high power setup is in the C band. I think it's between 5.7 and 7.2 gigahertz. Uh, or, I think it's less than that. 5.7 to 6.5 gigahertz and it's tunable. It has these tuning knobs on it and that's capable of putting out 2,500 watts with our current power supply. Um, so there's two. Are, are you interested in the the 2.4 gig? I mean, industry standard, widely available. I mean, is there? Are you interested in even utilizing that? I mean, that's cheap. It's so cheap. Uh, the reason why we're not doing the 2.4 gigahertz stuff is because um, the laminar magnetic field at that uh, at at those frequencies is a lot. Um, harder to achieve. And we couldn't find any high power setups in 2.4 gigahertz. Um, with, a, with, a, with a standard off the shelf microwave, you could get up to a KW. Yes, but those are very, um, those are unclean signals. Those are using magnetrons. We're not using magnetrons to create these microwaves. We're trying to create very clean microwaves that have only one specific frequency there. Um, and that can only be achieved with either a Klystron or a traveling wave tube amplifier. If you know of another way of doing that, um, I, I'm all ears. But uh, Jeremiah explained this to me, and I've you know, spoken to uh, several others in the beginning that uh, a, uh, a magnetron in a microwave will, will not work because of the, the wide range of frequencies that are involved. Understood. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely not clean. However, there are ways you can clean it up. Uh, uh, you know, with, with additional waveguide components, um, I think circulators might be, uh, one of them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, widely available. And plus you could rip out the launchers, uh, from the microwave oven. And then from there build rudimentary waveguide components by a circ by an isolator off, off the shelf, WR 340 waveguide, uh, a component. And then, uh, you know, it is, it's a very simple an efficient and cheap way to go about microwave uh, experiments. And, and I'm, I'm all game for it. I'm just uh, geared up right now with the Klystron and the power yeah. supply and all that stuff for this frequency range. So we're going to try it over here. If you want to try that, uh, you know, we'd be glad to help you and uh, you can set that up and we can, you know, help you with the setup and whatever we can do. Um, we want to see as many of these experiments replicated in, you know, all the frequency ranges, just understand that, that the uh, laminar magnetic field, the, uh, homogeneous magnetic field is, is difficult to attain. And uh, when you're dealing with lower frequencies, you need a much larger space for you, physically for your waveguide. And uh, the, the most homogeneous field we found was we were able to achieve, it was barely an inch in diameter, uh, inch in, in height. And uh, I think it's like an inch and a half in diameter. That's where we achieved a homogeneous magnetic field. So if you're gonna go for lower frequencies, the amount of iron you're going to need. It's going to be um, for 2.4 gigahertz. I think that's you'd probably need about six inch uh, space for your uh, for your waveguide. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's the, uh, it maybe less, maybe half that. Okay, uh, three, a three inch space. You're talking about 
probably five or 600 uh, pounds of iron for a uh, electromagnet that large. So that's a lot of iron. You want to get very pure iron too. Uh, or you can get, there are certain alloys of iron that have very high uh, magnetic permeability, especially for the core pieces. And then you have to get the, the windings around it, or you could use uh, permanent magnets in place as well and just uh, add on the, um, an electromagnetic component to change the frequency, to change the strength of the magnetic field a little bit. But um, achieving a laminar magnetic field is difficult. And uh, the, the lower the frequency, the larger the, uh, the, the, the magnet that, that creates this homogeneous field will have to be. Uh, Mark, if I could jump in real quick. Um, so Wayne was, Wayne was interested in Garrett's magnetron idea. And so what I'm wondering is you, you guys might want to exchange, you, you might consider exchanging emails or communications info, right? And that way you can, because it, it seems like this might be kind of a back and forth process or something like that. Um, so oh, yeah. Wayne, Wayne has actually tried it with a uh, magnetron. He basically took a, uh, an old microwave, drilled a hole in the bottom and stuck the sample in the center with the uh, permanent magnets. Uh, Wayne, you could turn on your uh, screen share. You could actually show them the device. Um, he did see some weight loss when the uh, microwave would turn on. Uh, I'm not certain that his test results are, are, are accurate because it could be there was microwaves, uh, you know, seeping out and affecting his scale and he didn't do a null test. Um, so th those are, those are things that we have to be careful about, but if it is possible with off the shelf, you know, broken microwave components and, and you could do it that way, that would be a much cheaper way for everybody to replicate this experiment. How many people have broken microwaves available? It's pretty easy to find and uh, it, stupid and simple and easy. If you can make a kit, that, that can do it and you can send it around to all these uh, universities. Um, you know, all, all Mark, what's, so what, what's the email address they should write to you? That's, that's what I'm asking. Oh, alternative, alternative propulsion at gmail.com. Alternative propulsion at gmail.com. Okay. And then, yeah. So, um, so Garrett, if, if you're interested, you know, alternative propulsion at gmail.com and that way everybody can kind of stay in touch. So. Cool, man. Yeah. That's uh, great. Garrett, Garrett, what's your, what's your background? How do you know this stuff? Uh, I do plasma technology R and D. Okay. Where do you work? Where are you located? Uh, we're in Colorado. Uh, we have an R and D company in Colorado. <laughs> and me and uh, Jeremiah have a, uh, a, a wish of going out to uh, Colorado to set up the, um, the lab to make a full size craft. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, there's a huge aerospace industry over here. Um, I mean, Boulder alone, there's like 400 aerospace companies. Um, and, uh, and a really good community that is working on pretty epic technology for sure. So I, I, I would, hey, Garrett, uh, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the cheaper high output solid state microwave bands. Um, I have an experiment called a two coil experiment. And it involves producing magnetic fields. And uh, Pablo, can you? Thank you. Uh, so what, what it effectively does is uh, it produces a magnetic field fast enough so that the transit time from the magnetic field produced at its emission point to the point where it's reacted against is shorter than the time it takes for the emission point to reverse its flux. And so what you can end up doing is effectively pushing against the fields that you produce within the constraints of the physical framework of the engine. And uh, if we look at a distance of about uh, 10 inches, it takes approximately one nanosecond for light to traverse that distance. And so if we could effectively invert our fields in that time, we could produce a magnetic flux that we could react against. But then the question becomes, how much power can we get into that magnetic flux that quickly? And uh, unfortunately, trying to get a high amount of power at a very, very fast frequency with a reasonable current has been a great difficulty uh, in trying to engineer. But uh, if you are aware of any solid state components, I know that with new GAN FETs, there's been a lot of tech coming out recently that allows us to do fantastic things with solid state high speed semiconductors. And uh, you just might be the guy to know about what's really available and how cheaply we could perhaps do it. Yeah, so there's three companies uh, that come to mind. One is DEI, um, Directed Energy Incorporated. They're located in Loveland. And uh, they make um, nanosecond pulse generators up to 10 kV. Sometimes they'll go above 10 kVs and maybe in the 12 kV, but nothing really higher. They'll end up forwarding you onto their uh, 
to their, their the broader community. And, uh, and they, but, the, but they're relatively low power, say 100 watts for a pulse generator and a 10 kV pulse generator at 100 watts is like, is like, t uh, like uh, uh, 10,000 um, bucks. But you can get some of their uh, pulse, uh -huh. generator, uh, pulse generators on eBay, like a lot of the three, three and a half kV, uh, say uh, 20 nanosecond rise, 200 nanosecond pulse width and 20, 20, second, 20 nanosecond fall time, um, which is a decent, decent, uh, decent capability is like a thousand bucks on eBay. I mean, and they're going, they're, they're going like hotcakes right now. Um, so DEI is one of them. Another one is um, transient plasma systems. Um, they came out of gun, gun, uh, uh, UC, uh, uh, USC uh, in, in, in California under the Professor Gunderson, and they did a lot of nanosecond pulse research. You know, they started in ignition systems for engines, then they got into emissions control, and then they got into the biomedical world where they were uh, eliminating cancerous growths so using using uh, uh, nanosecond pulse uh, uh, as a therapeutic uh, technology, um, and and then they spun off uh, one, their nanosecond pulse technology into a company called uh, TPS or Transient Plasma Systems. They also produce nanosecond pulse generators um, that uh, are, are pretty penny, like they usually are. Um, the technology is still pretty expensive, but it it is advancing. Um, uh, slowly. Um, uh, well, I would say that, that the technology is advancing quickly, but the cost effectiveness is, is coming down slowly. Um, so it's not, it's a nonlinear relationship between advancement and becoming more cost effective. And then I would say the, the most sophisticated, uh, I would say, or uh, the most advanced company that I've seen is Eagle Harbor. And they make really high powered nano second pulse generators. And if you were looking for a really uh, very intense high powered system, then I would, I would inquire with Eagle Harbor. I've uh, spent a great deal of time uh, specifically trying to engineer our own low cost um, nanosecond pulse generators. And we, I can tell you for sure, have not gotten there yet. It turns out that it's remarkably much more difficult to make a incredibly fast impulse than one might initially think from the engineering standpoint, uh, seeing as uh, we observe these transients all the time in various circuits, it seems like it would be a lot easier to make a high amplitude pulse, but then you end up with all kinds of noise and harmonics and other things that aren't predicted and it makes it incredibly difficult. Uh, right now I'm actually dealing with something that I wanna to present to the audience, which still remains. and. Uh, in attempting to measure the velocity, the propagation velocity of the electric field produced by a flat plate that received a sudden impulse from a Marx generator, I have placed two also flat plate probes at uh, some distance away. So the first probe is three feet away from the surface plate of the impulse plate. And the second probe is six feet away. And what I'm attempting to measure is how long it takes for the electric field to reach the first plate and then subsequently the second plate but I'm getting all kinds of strange, har uh, strange harmonics in my cables. Now, uh, since then I have a 500 megahertz scope. I have five giga samples per second. So it's not the fastest sampling frequency, but I do have the resolution to at least display a pulse. However, instead of getting a nice clean impulse, I'm getting these nasty little sinusoid waveform harmonics and I can't seem to filter them out. Any advice from anybody here on how I can get a clean signal from my pickup plates to measure this electric field impulse would be very helpful. Sorry if that was a bit much. No, I what think- What kind of cables are you using? Um, I've tried so far the uh, probes that came with the scope, which are 100 megahertz probes, just to see if I could measure a, a, a muted impulse, figuring that some of the energy would go into the capacitance of the cables. I've tried some 75 ohm UHF um, solid, uh, solid dielectric cable. I've tried some soft dielectric silicone cable, 75 ohms. I've tried some 50 ohm cable of uh, different lengths, seeing if I could try to, you know, figure out where the harmonics were coming from. And then I've also tried just a straight piece of wire with a plastic insulated jacket and uh, having the scope grounded and connected at an outlet across the room so that even the power cable was straight. And uh, even still, I'm getting harmonics into the system and I just can't seem to figure out how do we eliminate it.
I'm really stuck on it. I didn't, uh, I wish I would have written down uh, uh, some of the parameters that you said, but uh, um, you know, uh, a shielded environment, your junctions being shielded, the, sh the wires being as short as possible. Um, it seems as though you could do sort of a, uh, a test sample um, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, compare it against uh, uh, different distances between your emitter uh, and, and your target. Um, again, I, I don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to pick up all of the different, uh, I, I'm sorry, I guess, let me just simplify the issue that we're having. It's difficult to tell where the peak of the impulse is because instead of having a nice, clean, sharp impulse peak, we're getting these sinusoids that are difficult to line up. So it's, it's hard to tell when that wave form reaches its peak and, uh, we're noticing that the harmonics on the two cables, imagine that you have a waveform that sort of starts out at a low frequency and becomes a high frequency over time. What I'm noticing on the two different probe inputs, which are different lengths in this case, to keep them as short as possible and the scope being located linearly all the way back from them is that I'm getting the same waveform to some extent on both cables, but uh, the waveform on the second cable is taking place uh, slower than the waveform on the first cable. So it's almost like one is, is slowed down, but the, uh, the peaks in the valleys, you know, it's not like a clean sinusoid. It's like you have, you know, maybe three or four peaks high, and then you have a couple of valleys, like two valleys low, and then another peak high and another valley low. So you can sort of line up waveform on channel one with channel two, and you can see, you know, these are the same waveforms, but for some reason, one is faster than the other. And I've been trying to wrap my head around how to, how to figure out when the waveform has actually hit the probes, because it's just not clean now. And I'm, I'm still struggling with that fast impulse voltage. Maybe it's my output. Maybe it's not actually the probe. Maybe just uh, my, my, my rise time on the Marx generator is perhaps too slow. It could be the case. But uh, honestly, I don't know yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I wanted to present it to see if anybody had advice. Yeah, I would continue conditioning your, 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 your cables. I mean, have you wrapped toroids around them and tried to do reverse windings on, on, on sort of a... a well, no, because we're looking for signals that are faster than uh, a fraction of a nanosecond, and those toroids would effectively completely devour those fields and turn them into heat. And those are specifically the fast fields that we're trying to measure. Uh, so instead of filtering them out, that's that's the only thing that we want, actually. And if we delay it through, you know, a high inductance coil, um, those fast transients are going to be eaten in the inductance of that coil or the uh, parasitic self-capacitance, the windings thereof. And so that also presents a problem. How, uh, how long are your cables? Uh, the first cable was five feet. The second cable was eight feet to keep them three feet apart for the measurement test. Wow. Can you shorten it down to less than a foot? Um, I can shorten one cable down to less than a foot for the farthest cable. But if I am to place my scope at any point, if I place it the farthest distance away from the entire measurement where, you know, the impulse plate emits a field and it, it radiates how this is actually the impulse plate that we're looking at here. So the field emits off the surface of this and it, you know, it travels outwards. And as it's emitting, you know, let's say our, our first probe is here and our second probe is here and they're equally spaced from, you know, the first probe to the surface of this is one distance. And that same distance is repeated from the first probe to the second probe. So um, that's sort of how the measurement is set up. And there's a three foot space in between this and the first probe and the three foot space in between the first probe and the second probe. But uh, the, the peak of that waveform is just not clean. So I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, that's what I was sort of saying to clarify. Sorry. Seems like a really interesting setup. Uh, in order to uh, give, give further suggestions, I just have, would have to understand it better. Um, I, I could only see one part of the physical system and I can kind of visualize what your what what the rest of the system looks like um, but uh, I'll just have to troubleshoot with you you know point by point yeah if you're willing to work with us uh, we'll, we'd love to converse with you later I have some videos of the experiment being ran and some pictures of the very terrible waveforms and harmonics that we're picking up so you're welcome to see that and hopefully if, if you see it you may spot something that's obvious to you but completely invisible to me because I just don't have the experience that you might have. So uh, we'll definitely love to work with you if you're willing.
Yeah, Sorry about I, that. What I hope to do in the future is uh, when everyone is here at the lab, we're going to go live more and more often every time we have something to show. And um, you can all watch it live and see the scopes from different angles because we could we could live stream from several different cameras in the shop and show you that, you know, this oscilloscope in one plane, you can watch it all in grid view and see the experiment from several different angles and get an idea if there's an if, if there's a miscalculation or something can be done better. Uh, we can change it in real time and just, you know, swap out that cable and see what happens and one slowly build up off of everybody's knowledge in these different fields and, you know, get to the bottom of what's actually going on. Uh, that's my, uh, that's my hope. What's going to happen. Uh, Jeremy, you, you had a uh, question before. You got to unmute yourself. Talking to me. You yeah. talking to me. Um, I didn't have uh, I, I don't think I had a question. Um, I was just, you know, watching in some of the live chat. Some of the oh, you said make this, you wrote in the uh, in the chat make this plate smaller or zero index meta material for the frequency you are using yeah if you use a zero index meta material tuned to that frequency it would eliminate all the other um, it might be a good way to eliminate all the other uh, noise signals um, that Jeremiah was looking for advice earlier that that, that was some of the comments in the, in the chat. Um, and then also suggesting using a smaller plates because a smaller plate will be uh, less re receptive to a less uh, less of a range of frequencies. But in any case, uh, you you want to um, uh, maximize damping of the frequencies that you don't want, basically. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, any thoughts on that? I don't think he's with us. <sighs> Okay. Um, what do you guys uh, all think of the uh, conference this time? Um, we had to change up the rules in order to allow everyone to speak in order. And uh, Tim, Tim was acting as the moderator. We just, we just want to get some feedback. It sounds pretty good to me. I enjoyed it. I think it went. I think it went very well. Oh, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Wayne, Wayne gave us a, a thumbs up. Tim, are you still there? I enjoyed it. I would say I, I'm super tired now after six hours, going strong for six hours, man. But uh, I think we, we to one, that. Of our, one of our most successful uh, streams ever um, as far as viewer turnout and, um, and engagement with the audience. We have a three over 3,000 playbacks on it and uh, like well over 100 viewers peak for, for the entire thing. So, um that's pretty impressive for for given the content we're not talking about things that are super easy for you know a wide range of audiences to follow so right um also um i talked to tim about this uh, before we started he uh he was intentionally setting it up so that there is one question and then there's an answer so it can sort of be like a uh its own segment so you can cut up the video question answer and then you could give it a title and uh, anyone who's interested in that specific question whether it be the uh, uh, abduction stuff or are we talking about waveguide you know they're they're totally different you know for totally different audiences so we can cut it up and uh, you know stick it all in one big um, in one in one grouping of videos and then anyone who wants to watch the entire thing can just jump from video to video but each one will have its own title for whoever's interested sort of the way um, uh, what's his name? That big uh, host does it. Uh, Joe Rogan. He cuts up the videos into yeah, the uh, clips channel. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta put clips because man, no one's gonna sit through six hours of this. Uh, we we'll yeah. have to do do some highlights of some some of the key parts. So um, definitely needs to be some some of that going. Uh, even in the previous videos that I have, there's there's quite a bit of material that we can go through and just clip out like key key stuff because sometimes you have to sit through for a while in order to get one key thing. And um, I don't know, those um, gems. Just a, just a suggestion is that I, I watch UK Column News, which broadcasts three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And when they post their videos, they actually have a, a kind of a, a timeline, you know, of topics that they cover, you know, so that'll be at the 21 minute mark, you know, they're covering this, blah, blah, blah. It's just wherever it is. If you just index it, then people know where to go. I mean, it might just be easier than cutting it up into separate videos, just a suggestion. Uh, that's what Tim did with the last video. He indexed it 
and stuck it all in one group so you could watch the entire thing but if you wanted to separate- yeah and I'll, I'll probably do that with mine but then in this one we have two videos actually and that, i think that makes things easier and so jeremy has one too that live feed of his that is going to roll directly over to being a recorded one so maybe if he puts timestamps in which makes it easier for him and then i'll probably just end up cutting this one up anyways uh, but the, the good, um, what happened over here this, uh, in this uh, session was that we had very organized and coherent questions that were answered in full. So those are, uh, you know, complete clips in an, of themselves, making it very easy to uh, separate them. And by separating them, you can give them all separate titles to uh, attract different crowds. So that's something that's something to think about, you know, whether you're interested in the uh, the alien abduction phenomena, whether you're interested in the the gyroscope uh, experiment and uh, Mike Gamble's pit that that all fit in in one segment and you could watch it, you know, for 10, 15 minutes and see the entire thing happen. Well, I, 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 and I think this is a really exciting session. I mean, the thing that I like about it is it exposes people to the engineering side of it, you know, and a lot of just younger people out there. Right. I mean, again, I'm thinking back to. You know, when I was a kid reading about this stuff, if if things like this had been available, it probably would have saved me years worth of research, right? So, yeah, that's 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 crucial. Well, are we are we just about done for this evening then? Yeah, I'm I'm ready to wrap it up. Um, I definitely think this went well, and 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 again, it's saving people years of research and saving people time and being able to find stuff and then connecting dots for people. That's that's really what this is about. And I, and I love the idea of this ability to fast track the peer review process. So now so now we can do these experiments in real time, and sort of uh, you know keep keep this mark. We need to keep this going with like uh, you know weekly or or you know and scheduled scheduled weekly events. Um, just to keep the interest going on this and keep the momentum up and, and keep uh, new new people um, cycling into the, the uh, feed. Well, um, cause, uh, you know, and if I, if I could jump in briefly, so you guys do have ongoing experiments. You guys have stuff you're building. And then we had uh, Tom Valone, who had talked about coming back. Um, Ron. Ron who, who can, needs like four or five hours. He's, a, he's an overflowing encyclopedia. And, you know, so yeah, there, there are those two gentlemen and then um, Eugene Poglinoff might be able to come later in December, uh, John Hutchison at some point. And I, I think his limitation is um, he has bandwidth, but not everywhere. And so I, 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 if I understand correctly, that's kind of his limitation. Um, George Hathaway actually signed in briefly today. So George was here. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's exciting it, and it'll be interesting to see kind of where things go and we'll just have to kind of figure out where to where to do the next one so oh did hathaway say anything or he just uh was watching? no i don't think george said anything okay he, he was being shy <laughs> that's that's fine uh, we'll get him eventually we're hurting sheep we're hurting cats hurting cats yeah, yeah. hurting cats so we'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll schedule the next one and keep it posted uh, in, in advance so that and we should schedule them like on a regular basis so that people on social media can easily keep up and, and keep uh, in tune with these things. And, and it will build it will just build more amazing, um, more amazing momentum is what I mean. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading in the chat. People are people are real psyched about how this went. And they're saying lots of good we things. We could do another one. Um, I think next week, the same time, it would probably be a, a great weekend for it. Everyone's going to be stuck at home anyways because of Thanksgiving and COVID. Uh, and so long as we put out, you know, the speakers way in advance and you know, send it out to as many people as possible and hype hype the hell out of it, we can expect a lot more people to show up with relevant questions. And I'm really liking the way uh, Tim handled the crowd and gave everyone a chance to speak. Uh, you know, the uh, the chat, putting your um, your question, ask, asking for permission to ask a question in the chat system sort of worked very well. And I think that's a model that we should continue with. Wonderful. Okay, well, let me stop recording now then. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for attending. <laughs>